Good afternoon, friends. My name is Joan Arne Halperin, and I am the grateful daughter of Susan Mendes visa recipients. Olivia has planned a fabulous program for us today, and I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Robert Jacobitz. Robert began championing the cause of Aristides de Souza Mendes uh, in the 1980s. In a paper he wrote in 2008, Robert describes this intricate operation. There'll be a link to the article in the chat and you can uh, read his comprehensive bio at the SMF page about us. Robert is now secretary of the foundation and chair of its advisory council. Robert, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Joan. And thank you for your kind introduction. And just before I introduce our presenters, I invite the audience to please type your questions via the chat icon at the bottom of the screen. And just remember, we will not be acknowledging the raised hand for questions. Just type them in would be most adequate. And now is my distinct honor to introduce two unique and remarkable individuals in the world of Jewish life, who each has a unique story to share with us. Janice Major is a daughter of Helmut Mazur, her German Jewish father who escaped Germany by literally walking out of the country on the advice of a Hitler youth friend the day before he was to be rounded up to be sent to a concentration camp. And an English Jewish mother of Russian heritage, Lily James, who after a distasteful anti-Semitic experience in her native London, immigrated to Palestine, where she and Helmut met and married. Janice, Janice was subsequently born in Eritrea, making her an Italian citizen, where her parents had moved from Palestine to find employment. And in 1949, because of changing political factors in Eritrea, the family settled in Uganda where Janice lived from 1949 to 1960, before moving to Christchurch, New Zealand in 1961 for her college education. Today, she lives with her husband, Tom Zichelli, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Rabbi Gershom Sizomu was born into a Abu Daya family, and his grandfather was the community's leader. The Abadiah were persecuted during the years of Idi Amin regime when it was illegal to be openly practiced the Jewish faith in Uganda. During his childhood, Suzomi's father was arrested for building a sukkah to celebrate the holiday of Sukkot. His father eventually was released. In 1979, following the overthrow of the Amin government, freedom of religion was restored in Uganda and Suzomo's family celebrated by hosting 200 people in a Passover Seder consisting of homemade matzah and mako, an Ugandan banana wine. Janice, please share with us your unique family story in Uganda. First of all, hello and greetings, and much felt thanks to the Susan Mendes um, Foundation, and especially to Robert and Olivia and Paolo, um, for their help to get this thing going. Um, I, you know, I'm just pinching myself because I, I really can't believe that Rabbi Gershom and myself are on a program together, separated by one century. You are witnessing a historic moment. I, I really am pinching myself. It's, it's interesting to think that um, when I ask, when people ask me, where am I from? And I say Uganda, they immediately say the Abadaya and look at me sort of in disbelief. And so it is because of this that I did some research and wrote a book called Shalom Uganda, a European Jewish community on the equator. 
And I suppose in modern parlance, I should say a white community on the equator. I believe that Rabbi Suzumu had no idea about our Jewish community last century on the equator. And we didn't really know very much about his Abadiah either. So today you're going to hear about both of us. So here we have a map or two of Uganda and Africa. And you can, and everyone knows where Africa is, of course. In days gone by, there was a lot of trade going on up and down the East African coast. But there's a coastal plain in between the coast and Lake Victoria, that little blue patch that you can see under the word Uganda. In 1903, as some of you would know, there was a thought about the Uganda plan. And this meant that the border of Uganda and Kenya changed, the border moving slightly eastward for Uganda, making Kenya bigger. In the White Highlands, and especially around Eldoret, if you look at the other little map, and that is where I went to boarding school. That is the area called the White Highlands where the Jewish settlement was supposed to have been. Thank goodness it wasn't, because can you imagine with all of the political issues that have gone on and a British government official between the Jewish community and um, Britain, it never, ever would have flown. But it was considered a stepping stone. So Kampala is nestled in under the green around the edges of equatorial Lake Victoria. And in my childhood, I thought it was a perfect place, but it was just merely a stepping stone to elsewhere. Here we have in 1956, a Jewish community Seder. In this particular photograph, it shows just about the whole of my Jewish community. Can you imagine just 20 families immediately after the war, swelling to the huge number of 23 families in the 1950s? It, it, um, it amazes me that we were able to have all sorts of high holiday celebrations. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, these all happened, but we were secular. We had no rabbi, no synagogue, no Torah, no cheder, just us. We were about 500 miles away from Nairobi. Nairobi, was the mother load. Nairobi was the place we turned to for help for Jewish things. Um, and in fact, because of that, in 1950, my parents got into our little Ford prefect and we went by road over potholes to Nairobi where I was put on a chair to rehearse, to say the prayer for the second birthday of Israel. My parents were very proud, of course. Here is the um, event for Chief Justice Joseph Herbstein's visit for the United um, Israel Appeal. He came from South Africa in 1958. And as you can see, some of us, some of us were here dressed very beautifully, welcoming Chief Justice Herbstein. My mother is second from the right, and my father is the third from the right. If you look slightly to the left, you can see a woman who looks rather like an East Indian woman, or I suppose in modern day language, Asian. But this particular couple came from Cochin. And because they were Jewish, of course, they were included in all of the things that were Jewish in the holiday time. One year, we had a rabbi come from Nairobi and we settled on a kindergarten room and we got it all organized so that we could have a service. Unfortunately, many of the people really couldn't follow. My father wore my cousin's newly bar mitzvahed talit. Um, and my mother wrote and said, well, you know, just sort of an effort at, at keeping Jewish, a bit rough, but." pretty good anyway, sort of thing. So we did our very best um, because we didn't have a rabbi, we didn't have 
a synagogue, a Torah, and so on. Now there's a picture there of a woman called Ilsa Dockelman. I can't see the slide, but she's actually, I think, sitting next to my father. And this particular woman was about 18 when she came with her parents from Germany in 1939, the last ship called the Usambara that left Germany. They arrived in Mombasa with just five English pounds in their pocket, not enough for the head tax in Kenya. In Kenya, the Jewish women would come down to the railway station and um, entice anybody they possibly could to get off the train and become a farm manager, and if single, perhaps marry one of their daughters. But this particular family had to carry on on the train, which had been built following an ox cart um, trail way back in 1901 to 1905. Ilse Dockelman became the nanny for the governor general of the day. This of was very different from when I was a child. It would have been a black ayah or nursemaid. And um, she carried on to marry a man called Victor Franco, who's very important here. There was another woman who came and the story that I always heard was that she had walked out of Poland by herself. In actual fact, she had walked, yes, by herself because she had lost her family due to um, you know, all of what happened during that time, not part of this conversation. And um, she had joined other Polish refugees walking towards Russia via Iran, Iraq, India, landing up in Kampala in the Koja camp. Koja was a camp, a refugee camp on the shores of Lake Victoria. In 1957, I was a girl guide and I um, was there camping over the weekend and I could not understand for the life of me why there were toilets. In 2005 in England, Teresa Franco told me that that was part of the Koja camp. Those people who died in the refugee camp have a beautiful cemetery under magnolias as I understand. My Jewish community has no cemetery. Ha. So here we are. Of course, I'm the one with my hand in front of my mouth. Um, there were just four weddings which happened in Kampala, one in the 1940s, two during my time there, and one um, in 1962, just after the independence. Of course, these marriages were not supervised by a rabbi. They were generally set very secular. This was the wedding of Steve Pullman, who was a Polish Jewish refugee, and his non-Jewish wife, Audrey. Just to give you an idea of the, the, the population, there were 95,000 people, um, sorry, 9 million people altogether, and only 23 Jewish families, 5,600 white people, and 48,000 um, Asian people. So, when we had um, Pesach, we only ordered 60 pounds of matzah compared with over 1,000 for Nairobi. We only had um, 42 newsletters, which came out twice weekly, and um, Nairobi ordered 200. So you can see we were very far from the mother load and very isolated. Empire Day. Well, look at the man in the white pith hat, Sir Andrew Cohen, a Jewish, Governor General, the first Jewish Governor General in Uganda, the first governor not to plunder the country, to be interested in African education and to help to prepare the country for independence. The young man reading the youth proclamation is my cousin, Justin James. And you can see Constance Naluli, a nurse, looking on a trainee nurse and an East Indian Asian Boy Scout whose face is covered. So in the workplace, it was all right to have interracial relations, but in socially, it wasn't considered to be quite so correct. However, there was a man called Merrick Poznanski 
who married a black woman because they were both at Cambridge together in England. And he was the curator of the uh, museum in Kampala at that time. And he knew how to lead a service as did Victor Franco. So we were few and far between. There were also four deaths in that we know of in Kampala at that time. And my mother, sat with my uncle until the time that he was buried. Of course, no Hevra Kadisha. This is Victor Franco, who was very important from the point of view that together with Ruth Levitin, the other bridesmaid, whose father, Phil Levitin, and grandfather, Morris Levitin, were helpful to the Abadiah from 1921, when they converted to Judaism officially, until um, Aryeh Oded, a Jewish Adonite a diplomat who was in Kampala, made contact with the Abadiah, believing that he was the first Jew to meet with the Abadiah. In actual fact, these three men had um, met with the Abadiah group throughout those sent those decades had provided money and education to them. And I know, Rabbi Suzumu, that this is very different from the history that you present of your, of your beginnings. But I believe that through my research, Morris, Morris Leviton was the man who um, you call Moshe. And so here is my book, Shalom Uganda, and you can buy it if you like, and it will tell you all of the nitty gritty details about how my Jewish community died, didn't survive, and is forgotten last century. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. And Rabbi Gershom, could you uh, please tell us about the most interesting story of the Abu Daya Jews of Uganda? And unmute yourself, please, Rabbi. It is great to hear the story from Shalom Uganda book. And I'm actually looking forward to reading that book. It is very, very interesting that the person we called Moshe was actually Maurice. <laughs> it is very enlightening. But anyway, I am third generation of a community that started in 1919. The word Abayodaya is Luganda word for the people of Yuda. Abayudaya, Yudaya. From the, uh, every Jew is called Abayudaya. Actually, all of us who are on this Zoom session and we are Jewish. In Uganda, they call you Abba Yudaya. It's not, it's not unique to us as a community. Uh, Jews in Australia, Israel, America, Europe are called Abba Yudaya. So in 1919, Semei Kakungu, a former military general who assisted the British to colonize most parts of East Africa, had read the Christian Bible. And instead of converting to Christianity, he discovered his own religion called Judaism. He circumcised himself and his sons and his servants and began to observe the laws of Torah, including Shabbat, strictly observing Shabbat from Friday to sundown on Saturday, observing the laws of Kashrut as laid down in the five books of Moses, Leviticus chapter 11, spells out which animals, which birds, which fishes are kosher and which ones are not. Uh, he also uh, built 36 synagogues and converted over 8,000 people to Judaism. In 1926, my grandfather was old enough to remember that they went to the mikvah and the two people that he speaks of, he speaks of Moshe, which now I understand would be Morris 
maybe the pronunciation was difficult for him, and another one called Yosef. Having been to the community several times and teaching members of the tribe uh, laws of Judaism, and bringing actually there is a, a Bible that was donated, which we still have. It 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 is a, a metallic cover Bible, which is in Hebrew entirely in Hebrew, was donated and that acted as the Torah for the community. Few people began to learn the Hebrew language. Unfortunately, Semeika Kungur died in 1928. Before the community had an unable person to take over from him, my grandfather volunteered to become the new leader. Uh, the late Samson Mugombe was the next rabbi after the founder. And he led the community throughout the 30s and 40s and 50s up to the early 90s, late 90s, 1990s, I mean. Uh, Samson Mugombe faced a challenge. The numbers that were about 8,000 reduced because the Christian missionaries at that time uh, provided education, but at the expense of Judaism. Whoever wanted to go to Christian missionary schools was required to convert to Christianity. So we lost so many of our young people to Christianity in search of education. Uh, in 1962, the, the, the uh, Uganda got its independence. And uh, around the same time, the embassy of Israel opened and Ariel Oded, who was mentioned earlier by the previous speaker, it was the first secretary of the embassy of Israel. He was told about the existence of a local Jewish community. Together with his team, they came to visit on Passover. When they arrived, the community had no idea of the seder because their Judaism was extracted directly from the Torah. It was biblical Judaism, not rabbinic Judaism. So what does the Bible say about Passover? that there will be a sacrifice, a kurban Pesach, a sacrifice on the 14th day, which, mean, which is the eve of Passover. And so all they found them preparing a Paschal lamb and actually was shocked to see that the Jewish community was told about was observing laws of sacrifices. It was ordered who taught the community that uh, ever since the destruction of the temple, Jews no longer offer sacrifices and many laws have changed as a result or have, have remained unobserved, especially regarding sacrifices. So uh, Oded connected the community to uh, rabbinic Judaism through uh, communities in England and Israel. They donated Sidurim, books about Halakha, the books about the Hebrew language, and they, they actually offered to take two of our younger people to Israel to study to become rabbis at one of the Orthodox yeshivas in Jerusalem. But this did not take place because uh, in 1971, before they had left to go for yeshiva, Yidi Amini took power and immediately outlawed Judaism. It was forbidden to wear a kippah. It was forbidden to do any ceremony, uh, including Brit Mira, or even a funeral. Anything to, to do with Judaism was completely forbidden. And many people lived in fear. You rightly said, my father was arrested for being belligerent. He, 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 he stubbornly built a sukkah and was found studying the Bible in the sukkah. And they only survived after the family paid a bribe to the officer who demanded that he, if he, we didn't give a bribe, our father would be killed. Uh, in 1976, there was some relief when uh, the hostages, Israeli hostages, uh, uh, Jewish hostages at, uh, 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 who, who were hijacked by Palestinian terrorists landed in Entebbe and uh, 
a Jewish army from Israel flew all the way from Israel and detected and led by Yoni Netanyahu, rescued the hostages, a few were killed, but that was a big relief, it was a statement that God was uh, listening to our prayers. And indeed our prayers came to pass in 1979. It was Erev Pesach, it was 11th day of April 1979 when Amin was defeated by a combined force of Tanzanian soldiers and the Ugandan rebels. And we celebrated Passover in style by drinking more than four cups of Uganda wine. We call it Matoke wine. It is out of bananas and it is almost 80% alcohol. So you can imagine at the end of the seder, everybody was the happiest. I had never seen anything like that before. Actually, I'd never gone to the synagogue because I was born 1969. And before I became aware of anything, it was Idi Amin in power. Mm. During that seder, I was motivated by the fact that uh, Amin, who was uh, like a pharaoh, was defeated. So I decided that I would go to rabbinic school and become the next rabbi. So in 2003, God brought that opportunity. I was accepted at Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies in Los Angeles. And I, uh, in 2008, I was ordained. Los Angeles was something. We came from a, a, a rural Uganda where there was no electricity, no running water, and we ended up in Bel Air. Those of you who know Bel Air, the re almost the richest part of California is Bel Air. And we were in this place we thought was heaven, where you jump in a shower and say, let there be warm water and it's flowing all over you. And the, the kitchen, you don't have to use firewood, you have to turn some a button, switch on a button, and things are cooking. You, have, you don't have to go to a well to collect water like we do here in Uganda. You just turn on water. Everything was in our house. And for five years, we were living in the heavens of Bel Air. Then came the time for us to leave. And my wife wanted to take a dishwasher with her because the dishwasher actually was a, a miracle there in Los Angeles. We miss Los Angeles, we are back in Uganda, we have a, uh, a community that we have built. Now it is over 1,500 people. We have schools, although we have difficulties operating them because of operating costs. We have a synagogue, actually more than five synagogues. We have more than five synagogues with Sifrei Torah. I have a yeshiva where I I train people to become religious leaders and they go, they help me to lead the different villages and different synagogues. Uh, right now, we, the, 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 the main challenge we have is that we want to transition from subsistence farming, which is dependent on rain. And sometimes rain doesn't come in its time and there is famine and food shortage. We want to transition from that kind of uh, poverty to uh, micro, we need a microfinance uh, uh, project, which will help people, our, our people gain access to cheap credit or to free credit so that they can start their own businesses and transform their lives from being subsistence farmers to some kind of commercial activity that will help our people live a decent life. So I know I am supposed to speak for 15 minutes. I have not timed myself. I want to stop there for the convenience of time and thank everybody and thank the previous speaker for the wonderful presentation. And I really look forward to reading the book and to learning more about our history. Thank you so much for your audience. Thank you very much, Rabbi. It was a delight. Um, seeing you again and hearing your wonderful story. We're now going to show a, um, a prayer that the rabbi leads the congregation. Um, it's the Shema, and uh, along with his daughter, Nava.
Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Era ono yagalanga, Adonai Rubale Wom. No mutima gogona, ne meme yo yona. No mutima gogona, ne meme yo yona. Ere bigambo vino, bien kula gira lero. Yes, please. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I'm sure that everyone here listening, watching and listening today feels elevated by, by your, your presentation and that Shema. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Janice. Really wonderful, heartfelt, and uh, Shalom Uganda. Who would ever think they'd see those two words together? In any case, I'm here to tell you about uh, next Sunday's presentation. Our program features the Alb Albanian Code. It's the work of award-winning Israeli filmmaker El Katsir. The film tells the little-known story, another little-known story. You know, a lot of these stories are little-known, uh, of how thousands of Jewish refugees in Albania were rescued in World War II. The trailer is available on the SMF events page. If only more countries in Europe had, had an Albanian code. This, this program next week is a free program. 
and the week after, on August 29th, we'll meet Natan Sharansky. Mr. Sharansky, as you know, uh, is very famous. He'll tell us his personal story as a spokesman for the human rights movement in the Ukraine and uh, as a leader in the struggle for the right of Soviet Jews to emigrate to Israel, which he did himself in 1986, the very day of his release uh, after nine punishing years in prison. You also know him as a leader in Israeli politics and much, much more. Mr. Sharansky will be in dialogue with the historian, Dr. Gil Troy. And Dr. Troy is a distinguished scholar of North American history at McGill University, who was recently designated an Algemeiner J100, one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life. Dr. Troy collaborated with Mr. Sharansky on the latest book called Never Alone, Prison, Politics, and My People. This is a paid program uh, with a donation of one uh, of $18 or more uh, to the Susan Mendes Foundation. In addition, we are offering autographed copies of their book with a deep discount of 30% off which comes out to $21. And this includes uh, shipping in the USA. At this point, we only have 25 books available. So hurry and follow the link that you will find um, in the chat and also in an email after this program. So Robert, let's, uh, let's do the chat. Let's uh, do the that. The Q&A that, that, now. That's great. I have that information, but just to let people know, we should be posting, um, um, Rabbi is fundraising and it's clear that they are in need of money. Um, he is affiliated with an international Jewish organization that we should have posted on the chat, which is called Bechol Lashon, many languages, which essentially works with uh, community, isolated Jewish communities throughout the world. Um, those who are interested in uh, contributing should go to global Jews, dot org forward slash donate global jews dot org forward slash donate and they are again the financial the fiscal agents for the community in uganda and also um there was a question joan of how do they find um this recording of the shema if you google rabbi suzumo's name you will find that this young man has a series of YouTube channel um, recordings <laughs> on his own YouTube, right, Rabbi? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and so this man, again, there are many lectures as well as recordings. And also, as somebody noted, there is a CD that's available. And um, it is, again, uh, one title, I believe, is Shema but there are other titles that are on that, on that CD as well. That's available, again, I understand, um, through Amazon. And so some of the questions we have, one would be for Janice. Janice, one of the observations of the people was that there's no recorded Jewish cemetery in Uganda. And I know that's been frustrating to you and it's written in your book, but share with people that indeed from the community, people did pass away and were buried in Uganda. I find it really distressing because uh, to me, if there is no cemetery, there is no footprint that there actually was a Jewish community there. Um, there was one man called Fritz Metzler who converted to Catholicism in order to escape uh, during the Holocaust. He is buried and he, his um, headstone is the only one that has been found by Hammo Sen and one or two other people who have, and Rabbi Silverhaft have actually been looking to, to find the location of the cemetery. I believe that it's most probably because of um, a war, um, elephant grass grows very quickly and uh, no money for maintenance that this uh, cemetery has actually disappeared. Um, if this, talk of mine were longer, I would show you the headstone of my Uncle Murray, who is or was there. Of course, Dora Block, um, some people say she was buried in the cemetery, others say that she was thrown into a forest, others say that she was burnt in the sugarcane uh, 
um, plantation. Regardless, um, there was a Jewish uh, cemetery or a part of a Jewish cemetery in Kampala and it's not there. And I, I wonder what could be done to remember the Jewish community that was there and did aid the Abadiah to survive those years when they were not well known. Janice, one of, you just mentioned Dora Block, and I, I do know that the rabbi mentioned that um, um, someone was killed during the Entebbe raid, but I don't think he gave her name. And um, Great Britain actually um, severed ties, uh, political um, government political ties with Uganda on account of that heinous action. Right. Um, rabbi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Janice. And Rabbi, there's a question of where physically is the community located in Uganda? In um, what section the of the country, you know, sort of the logistics of where it is? Okay, mostly in Eastern Uganda. The center is in Mbale, Mbale city, where Kasemei Kakunguru was buried and where his home still, uh, although in a dilapidated form, still exists. The center of the community is right next to Semei Kakunguru's grave. Some people came in late, and unfortunately, we do not recognize raised hands. I know that Moshe um, had wanted to ask a question, but unfortunately, Moshe, if you could chat, if you could type it in the chat box, we'd be able to answer your question. Um, Rabbi, another question for you is: um, when the Christians tried to convert your people back to um, well, to Christianity. The question was, was there any resistance um, from the Jewish community in Uganda when this happened? Yeah, it happened during the uh, leadership of my grandfather. And I was fortunate to be told that there was resistance. And those who resisted, they did not go to school. It, it, the, the, those who resisted remain as members of the community. Those who did not resist converted to Christianity. About one out of eight thousand, we had about one thousand five hundred, and they did not go to school. This is the reason why we are subsistence farmers. A few of our younger people have went to school in these days, but my mom did not go to school. My dad did not go to school. My uncles, because they resisted school. The only schools available were Christian missionary schools, so they were costs of resistance. The costs of resistance is the current economic state of the community. Rather like your, your great grandfather, Kakungulu, who also resisted the British government um, because he didn't like Christianity, he didn't like the British way of doing things. And yes. the start of his um, Jewishness, as I understand it, he wrote a booklet. And also uh, it caused one official to say that um, he had he he um, was causing a problem to the British government. <laughs> so I thought that was very good that he was a strong. A yes. Strong... <laughs> um, clearly, you know, the Hebrew and the English are spoken in the community. The question was what other languages are spoken within the community? Swahili is sort of like English. It links all sorts of other languages together because each tribe, as we used to call them, or group would have their own dialect. And so Swahili was the linking. It has Arab words in it as well, was used by the slave trader um, in days gone by as well. And so when um, Muslims, um, Islam came to East Africa, Swahili came as well. Good. So Thank you. Lingua Franca. Um, observation, and Janice, maybe you can answer it for me since the rabbi is not with us. I find it just so ironic and unfortunate that in so many ways there were two Jewish communities living in the same country and yet were not related, didn't know how to relate, and there was no vehicle officially um, between um, the Abadaya and the Ashkenazi community, and still the Ashkenazi community was not supported and its ability to continue in, 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 in Uganda. And I find that unfortunate. It's just a fact of life. In some respects, the Jews of Uganda were there too early. Um, Israel had, was just being established and they didn't have shlichin to come out and visit people. 
And it, it appeared you did not get very much assistance from Kenya or even from South Africa and other Jewish communities. And you write that, that you were so small, you could not establish any Jewish institutions, but your families did the best they could. And for people to understand your attempt, really you're reading a book is your legacy to the world of again, your dedication to the Jewish community, to the Ashkenazic Jewish community in Uganda. Would you like to respond to some of that? Thank you. It was also partially political. Um, you see, the, the black person in that time was considered to be um, um, a good worker. And so they worked on the plantations. The East Indian was the manager. The white man was on the top. So even when Rabbi J.J. Keki um, in the 1950s went to Nairobi on his own to ask for financial help and educational help, religious help, support. He was shunned by the rabbi of the day. So that was one thing. Um, also, um, Rabbi Gershom says that, uh, told us that his uh, community is in Mbali. That is the area that the British designated to Kakungulu um, for him to govern. And so, um, those people in Kampala often didn't go to Mbali because it was considered up country or Gulu where my aunt and uncle had a stint. So um, it, it, it was also secret. It was so secret that a Dr. Ludo, who was a pediatrician and came for a contract of two years, when I interviewed him in London in, the, in 2005, he said, what is the Abadiah? He had no idea. And he, and he had lived in Uganda. Another woman, Valora Muscovich, also the same. So I think that the people who knew had an inside track. We were sort of the second track and then people like Arie Oded and others were third track and didn't have that inside knowledge. So that's how come we were so separate. Political and was the main issue, I think. Thank you, thank you. Um... One individual um, has a note that um, says he's part of the African Jewish Congress, which I was not knowledgeable of, and would like to be in contact with Rabbi Gershon to see if there's a way that they create a project to locate the old, again, the Ashkenazic cemetery. Um, we'll relay that to the rabbi. But in the meantime, Janice, have there been efforts to try to survey again or whether it would be through whatever electronic means to find out where there was the Jewish um, cemetery. Do you know of anything of, such as that? I know that Rabbi um, Silverhaft um, has been looking and I wonder if perhaps he would like to say something about it. Um, we've yeah. been in contact. Hi, Robert and Joan and Janice. Nice to meet you all on Zoom. The new virtual well, way of South meeting African. people. You, yeah. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm South African, but I'm in Israel at the moment. So it's a small Jewish okay. world, you see. Um, oh, so, yes, we, through the initiation of Janus, we've been looking through for, the, for two areas, basically. First of all, for where the Jewish people, if there was, first of all, a Jewish cemetery consecrated for Jewish burial, uh, that's the first thing we're doing through the local historians and the local municipality. And also we are looking for where the center or a Jewish hotel or something, a, a site of Jewish history where we could establish a memorial and a tribute to the once Ashkenazi active Jewish community in Kampala and in Uganda just in general. So those are the two projects we're working on. And I actually wanted to speak to Rabbi Gershom, if you can put him in touch with me, um, because he's, he could be very helpful on the ground to actually work with us on this. I think it's a very, very worthwhile and important uh, pr uh, potential project mm -hmm. to undertake. Recording Jewish history. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, you're oh there. Rabbi, you're back. Hey, Mazel Tov, you're back. Hi, oh, Rabbi. We met yes, at the... Yes, I'm there. Rabbi, we met at uh, the 40th anniversary of we met the in South Raid. Africa and, and in South Africa. But we met with Mr. Netanyahu at the 40th yes, anniversary. Yes, yes, we met there. How are you, sir? 
I am good. Thank you. Good to hear good, you. Good, good. Thank, Thank you, for you being gentlemen. Back. Did you um, hear my comments? Did you have fun? Yes, I heard your comments. All right. And so Robert, I am willing. Right. I am willing to join that project. So Excellent. let us be in touch. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you, Robert. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Rabbi Moshe. We're Thank just you. About good to have you with us. Good to have everyone with us. This has been a most unique experience. And a wonderful uh, initiative. Well done to right. everybody. Thank uh, you. Rabbi Jones. Moshe, Rabbi Moshe, yeah. since you're in Israel, let's get some engineers to get a drip system to uh, <laughs> Rabbi Ger uh, Gershom. You know about what? the drip, Absolutely, right? absolutely. Right. Sure. Well, that's, right. yeah, that's, a, that's a really, really, that would be wonderful. Yeah. We need Thank to, we you, need everyone. To. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Rabbi Thank Moshe. You. We will be in continuing discussion with you, I believe. You. So listen, we now have a just a couple of moments for um, wrap up for um, people to, um, again, share the last thoughts. Janice, how would you like to, what would you like to do in, uh, in your last um, salutation? Goodbye to people, whatever you'd like to do. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And um, secondly, it was just lovely to hear um, Rabbi Gershom. And I wanted to thank um, Rabbi Silberhaft for his idea of perhaps a, a memorial or some sort of recognition for the Jewish community, which um, I always thought failed, but perhaps it never really did completely fail, as Robert pointed out, because it did help to support the Abadiah do that during their dark years. Um, so I I would like people just to know about the Ashkenazi community on the equator, um, because to me it is imploded. It is a lost star, forgotten and vanished. And I feel that every little bit that I can do to tell people is important. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, Janet, I hope that this program has lighted that diminished light so people will know more along with Rabbi Moshe and Rabbi Gershom coming together. So it's been a wonderful experience. Rabbi Gershom, what would you like to yes. leave? Uh, first of all, uh, I think this is a very wonderful program. I've never been to such a program and uh, I thank everybody for your audience. And uh, as we said, our main challenge as uh, Jews of Uganda is when we refused Christianity, the cost was we didn't, many people didn't go to school. So we don't have a history of uh, academicians or people who are employed in white collar jobs. We uh, suffer uh, poverty and uh, 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 subsistence farming, any help, whether it is drip irrigation, whether it is uh, supporting our microfinance program so people can do some business, it will be wonderful because we know that uh, to be Jewish is actually to be an example to the world. And we want to be example to the African world. Uh, I came from Nigeria. There is a, a Jewish community actually coming up there. We converted 95 people to Judaism in Nigeria. They are very committed, dedicated. The Igbo think that they are part of the lost tribes of Israel. So Africa could be another home of the Jewish people. And I think Uganda can be the second Israel as it was supposed to be. You know, it had the Zionist organization, World Zionist organization accepted the proposal to make Uganda, maybe we would be in Israel here. So we want to continue that dream and thank you. And I want to invite you to, to support our community and to be friends of Baba Yudaya. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi Joan. I think you give the farewell. Please. Yes, uh, yes. I think this afternoon we made a shidduch between Janice, the rabbi, the two rabbis, Rabbi Moshe yes. and Rabbi Gershom. Yes. Let's yes. see what happens. Let, we'll, Wonderful. We'll, We'll keep up with this. We'll keep up with this. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We've got marvelous programs ahead. Uh, come back. <laughs>